business is about working people that you like working with and you support them where you can. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with construction finance specialist Matthew Vincent, who is the director and founder of MCA Finance. So Matthew specializes in helping clients with a number of different types of lending solutions for their properties and projects, from your typical mortgages to buy-to-let mortgages. He works with bridging and development finance, commercial and business loans, mortgage restructuring and equity release mortgages, as well as many other types. In this conversation, Matthew and I discuss the challenges that many of our architectural clients from developers to private residential face when arranging lending and finance to make their projects happen. So we can understand that if we're able to help our clients with their understanding of finance, that it helps our ability to be able to win work and deliver projects the way that we feel that they should best be delivered. So we look at the opportunities available to architects as they deepen their understanding of project financing and as they expand their network with finance providers. And we also discuss potential new service offerings and revenue models that can be made possible through collaborating with finance specialists. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Matthew Vincent, whose details are all in the information. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Matt, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. Thanks for having me today. My pleasure. So slightly different type of um, conversation that we're having today. Um, you're not an architect, um, but you do work in construction and around a kind of the, in the finance world. And you help lender will you help developers and clients get financing for built projects and this is often a subject that architects we can miss or we can avoid or perhaps the only conversation we have with a client is do you have any finance do you have do you have a budget what is it but actually there's a big piece here of the more that we understand as an architect to be able to facilitate finance with clients means that our projects get built, which is better for everybody. So I think I'll begin the the question is, how would you describe what it is that that you do? Yeah, sure. So essentially, I I, I am a broker, I'm a brokerage, first of all. So I'm fully authorized via the the main regulator, the FCA. And I can arrange all types of property finance. So that can be, you know, personal mortgage, buy to let mortgage. Um, But I I tend to specialize more in the construction sector. So where developers or investors or even homeowners, admittedly, are looking to add value to a property that could be, you know, converting a house into eight flats. It could be building a large extension, converting into two houses, Um, any type of property project like that. And I help arrange the finance for those clients to, um, you know, complete the works essentially. And that can be for, you know, it can be different ways. Um, finance can be solely on the project itself. It could be using other assets. It could be maybe bringing in a joint venture partner or equally mm. it may be helping someone sell a site. You know, I work with developers all over the country. There is a, a lot of people where their business plan is to buy, get planning and sell. So I, I can link parties together to, to, to help with that. So, well, there are different types of finance then for different parts of the of a, of a build process. So, obviously, we know, you know, that, you know, most people might know that there's a difference between a buy to let mortgage and a regular personal mortgage. What other types of loans and lending is there for developers or anything to do with the commercial aspect of a build? Yeah. So, if you're looking at finance solely on the development project, so you know the title, which is where the works are being done, then you would typically either have a, a bridging loan or a development loan, um, which is a huge marketplace. And you know, the bridging loan 
did have a really bad name for itself uh, when I first started in the sector, which was probably about 11 odd years ago. Um, but it has matured significantly over that time frame. And, you know, arguably is a mainstream product now. Um, it's, it's a big market. It's a multi-billion pound marketplace. And it is designed for, for this type of project. Development finance is slightly different. You know, it tends to be where at some stage it is land. So it could be demolition and rebuild, or it may just be land planning and then rebuild. Um, to answer your question, you know, if you're looking at the sole site, you would typically have a senior provider, which may be a bridging loan or a development provider. And then you can also get what's called mezzanine debt, which is where you have a secondary lender who will lend a top up at a second charge. One of the interesting aspects is from an architect's perspective is that a client will often need to have designs or some sort of proposal for a site in some cases, which makes it easier to secure finance. So, which leaves the architect in a position where sometimes their, con their loans or the client's financing options are unavailable to them until there's been design, meaning the client has to pay for the architect out of their own, out of their own pocket. Are there finance options which enable um, the design to get done first and then to kind of go on to more, you know, the construction or development loan? Or yeah, there could be. These? Yeah, there could be. It would depend on the person's overall position, you know, on what their assets and attitude to risk are. Um, but you could look at raising finance against a different asset. Maybe you could take out a second charge mortgage if it's a you know a reasonably small sum. Maybe you could take out a new buy to let mortgage, or if they do own the site already unencumbered, you know you can release equity from that site hmm. um, to form. I don't like the word, but a part of speculation. So it might be that land that's owned and encumbered, and they need to raise money to support the planning process. Part of that would be the architect fees. So you could take out a bridging loan to, to help fund that. Obviously, you would need to have a suitable contingent strategy in place should plan be declined. You know, you wouldn't want someone to have a short term loan and not have the ability to pay it back. Yes, got it. Uh, so, so what are the, some the challenges that you see a lot of property investors and developers facing in terms of getting investment and, and getting their, their, their finance in order to be able to complete a project? This is something that actually has quite an impact on, on architects um, in terms of their fees. So um, it's not uncommon that developers might end up paying architects late, if you like, because their finance hasn't come through yet, which then effectively puts the architect at risk. Um, they're entering into a kind of paid when get paid contract when that wasn't the agreement. So I, I, I think here being able to, for architects to understand the challenges of what their developer clients going to be is very useful. I would suggest that you, you would look to bring someone involved kind of as early as possible to understand the, the cost of finance for the project and also the scope of finance as well. You need to understand, you know, what can that client achieve based on their background? They may have adverse credit. They may have, you know, other considerations as well, which impacts the cost of their finance. That would impact how much they can actually borrow and that may impact the design style that you, that you go for. I think it's a really interesting time for for parties like architects. You know, the, the construction sector is going through a change. You've got the whole focus on, on energy efficient homes. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that kind of design engineering is going to add quite significant value um, now and, and in the future. Um, so I would suggest that you, you almost have it as part of the package, you know, just by having someone involved to give them an idea of the finance options doesn't mean they have to use it. You know, they may have yeah. someone they already know. They may have access to investments or family funds. Either way, it doesn't matter. But at least everyone knows at the start what's the parameters, what avenue you're going to go down, and, and does that look feasible? Yeah. How have you partnered with architects in the past? So historically it would my relationship would be from the developer so the developer would right. already have an architect that they use we would engage in regards to the plans get an idea as to what the um, bill costs are likely to be for a developer more recently i'm working the model that i'm trying to create moving forward is where 
I have kind of a hub of key parties. So I, I'm quite software orientated. So I've got access to a lot of developers across the country, you know, more than I could, I could name initially. And mm -hmm. so I'm trying to create this kind of cradle to grave approach where I've got the right professionals in place to, to have this team. So I've got a bank of solicitors, I've got a bank of accountants, I've got quite a few architects that we can use. And I want to be in a situation where one of those parties comes to me and says, we've got this project, can we help? And then I'm bringing in those other parties too. So I might have a developer who's based in Surrey. He needs an architect for a scheme. I can then reach out to my client, Mac of Architects and say, we've got a client who's looking for this scheme. Are you interested to, to, to discuss? And then I obviously help with the development side. And again, flipping it, you know, I might have, I do have a client bank of developers willing to buy. An architect in Surrey may have a client who's just got planning to build four houses, doesn't want to build mm -hmm. them. They can come to me and I can help arrange a sale for them. So it's kind of adding that continuous relationship where everyone's adding value to everyone. Interesting. So it's actually kind of being a, being a connector as well as a, a service provider. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and obviously then you, you, you scale from there, right? You know, you, you get multiple projects from the same client bank, which, you know, it's just good business practice too. Yeah. Could you walk us through the, the process of the sorts of things that a client needs to do in order to be able to, to get finance for yeah. a project? What, what, what sort of due diligence do you do? What information do you need? Um, where, where are typical roadblocks? Okay. So I'd always start by just understanding the client's position. So, you know, what's their experience in development? If they haven't got any, what's the team they're looking to use? What's their experience? Mm -hmm. So they got, you know, the expected levels of insurances or, you know, PI in place. Um, a bit more about the client too, you know, what assets do they have? What income do they have? Is there anything there which could be of concern? You know, maybe they could be based overseas. They could have historic adverse credit. There may be reasons behind it. Um, you know, who is the person that we're lend, looking to lend to? Once you've done that, then it is based on the scheme. So on the scheme, we're looking at, okay, what type of project is this? You know, what's the liquidity like? What's the purpose? You know, it may not be a commercial purpose. It may be for owner occupier, for example. Um, I'm assuming for this, it's a commercial style purpose. Um, you know, what does it look like in regards to demand? You know, is there a demand for 20 new flats in central London? Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, it's a case of the actual viability. So, okay, we know what the scheme is. We know who the developer is. We know they can perform. What's the financials and what's the spec? And in, in terms of when you're looking at the demands, how do you kind of make assessments on that? Because I guess that's that's a, a kind of key component in terms of assessing your risk or the or the, the risk for the, for the lender. Yeah, absolutely. It is quite difficult. But what I tend to do is you can have a look on planning portals, for example, get an idea as to have similar schemes been granted over the last handful of years. You know, if you've got a, if you've got an area where there's been 50 new houses granted planning in the last two years and you're building the, the exact same thing, there's a, there's a good chance that could be saturated there. Um, there's also quite a lot of data available on different softwares, which gives you an idea as to rental demand, um, how long the house is on the market for of a similar spec. So, you, know, you can kind of gauge an idea from, from different sources there. Ultimately, you know, evaluation will be done on behalf of the bank. Um, it will be a rich charter surveyor and they will obviously comment on the you know, property market as a whole and then comment on the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the scheme as well. So when your um, a kind of a developer comes to you, you're putting in place initial finance what sort of time time scale are people looking at typically, and is there a different finance for, you know, for the design and for the planning as there would be for construction? There, there isn't really a different type of finance for design and construction. It tends to be built in one. But as I said right. before, you could look to utilize an asset to pay for the design, the planning applications, if you needed to. So. I wouldn't say that is a specific product banks have created, but you could raise that via an alternative product. Um, obviously, I see. compliantly. Um, Timeframe wise, again, it does depend on the type of scheme and the position of the client. You know, if it's like an auction purchase, for example, um, 
you know, you have to have funding typically within 20 working days of the auction date. Um, and that's absolutely fine. You know, there are bridging providers that will, that will meet that quite comfortably. If you're looking at a ground up scheme that's very early on, there isn't a huge amount you can do from the finance side until you have this more granular details. Uh-huh. Um, once you have those details, getting initial funding approved should be within 72 hours. Um, once you've got you know the relevant documentation on file and, um, and the scheme data, and then you're moving then towards the kind of professionals. You know you've got to get a quantity surveyor, um, an actual um, charter surveyor as well. So the timeframes, I would say that a ground up development case from start to finish, you're probably looking like two to three months being being open. Um, a bridging inquiry, you know, could be three weeks. So again, it really does depend on the type of scheme and where we're at. So I guess the, the other aspect of this would be the actual purchase of, of land. And does that come wrapped up into, you can get loans that will wrap up the purchase of the land as well as the construction and development value? Absolutely, yeah. So when you're looking at the finance for a project, typically a lender would look to lend based on three different parameters. Okay. So the parameters would be a loan to value, it would be a, which is basically how much you're borrowing against either the value of the site or the purchase price. Okay. Yep. Um, they have a loan to costs so how much they're lending as a percentage of the total project costs. And then they have a loan to gross development of value. So how much they're lending against what it's going to be worth when it's finished. Um, so all of that, you know, it would be able to support part of the purchase as long as all mm-hmm. three numbers stack up. So yeah, absolutely right. You can, you can get funding for land which either has hope value to get planning as long as there's sufficient research or already has planning, you can fund it straight away. So that last one, the GDV, yeah. this is the one that we hear developers talking about a lot. Um, that obviously is the one that's got the most question marks around it. So as a as a as a as a loan as a loan advisor, what sorts of details are you looking to ensure that that GDV is an accurate estimation? Obviously, you can never be. You know, that's where the you know, a lot of the risk is going to be involved. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of schemes are, are reasonably short term builds. You know, you're talking like a 15 month build, give or take mm-hmm. for um, a, a medium sized scheme. So you would typically base it on comparables as of today. You know, what are houses in that area you're selling for today? Is there a good demand for them? Um, how does the spec compare? You know, what are you building compared to what has, has sold over here? Is it a higher spec? Is it a lower spec? Mm-hmm. Um, again, a surveyor will also comment on you know, both the macro and micro um, con- um, observations of the marketplace, which obviously will have an impact on GDV. Um, it, it is challenging for a developer because you're essentially they're guessing house prices, right? Um, but you, know, you, can, you can reduce that risk by doing a lot of research as well. Yeah, and I and I guess as well the GDV, like the more clear on how much information you've got and what the build is going to look like and the complexity of it, that's going to make a difference on knowing what your end costs are going to be. Absolutely. And- I mean, the, the the more you can reduce speculation, the better, right? You know, if you know exactly yeah. how much something's going to cost you and to what spec you're going to build it at and how long it's going to take you if you're doing it yourself, you know, you're removing a lot of speculation away um, and it's going to increase project success. One of the things that's been happening a lot recently is, you know, issues with supply chains and the costs of a build can, you know, quite significantly change yeah. over the course of a few months in the design process. How do you deal with that with the finance? Because you might have gone in for a certain fixed amount of finance and then now you're finding yourself having to borrow more because yeah. you've got your numbers wrong or these these are kind of external factors where it's, it's difficult to, to gauge. And obviously, the further on you are down the process with this, if you were in construction, even worse. Yeah. How, how, how do you mitigate these sorts of risks or how, how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, that's a really that? relevant question in, you know, particularly the market we're now, or at least we have been over the last 12 months. You know, we've seen materials just, just skyrocket and I think there was a, a national shortage of plaster wasn't there for a couple of months as well. Um, and that is also why, you know, obviously I'm slightly biased there, but that's why 
it is really helpful to have someone advising on the finance. Um, you know, you do get a lot of developers that feel like a 5% contingency is suitable because they've built a house before. It's, right. it's really not, you know, I mean, a lot of banks will insist on a certain contingency in place. So typically between 15, 20%, depending on the size of the scheme and also depending on the net worth of a client. You know, you may have a client that has quite a large portfolio or, or access to liquid cash. And because of that, you know, if there is a problem, they can access funds. So rather than hampering the viability of a scheme by insisting on a 20% contingency, a bank might take a view and allow a 10%, you know, because they've got that ability to raise funds if needed. So it, it's just about being practical and sensible. It, costs can go up. We know that we've seen that. So if they do, what's your strategy? You know, and ideally that would be a pre-built in contingency fund so that you're not applying for anything new, you're just drawing down on that contingency. And bearing in mind that interest is typically only charged on what you've actually drawn down. So you're not being right. penalized for that. It is a, it is a and, protection. And worst and worst case scenario when the you you know the developer has got it wrong with their contingency that they've built in. Well, as part of the process, you typically would get a QS to, to review items as well, you know, so in this case, it would be a case that the QS and the developer have both got it wrong. Um, this is more focusing on a, on a ground up build as opposed to a, a, a refill or conversion. Mm. Um, and then you have to, you have to look at options, you know, is there, is there enough equity available that maybe we can restructure the borrowing? You know, can the lender increase their debt? If not, would a different lender do it? If not, could we maybe take out a, a mezzanine debt, which is like a second charge development loan. Could we look at other assets? Um, or if we had to, you know, do we need to look at some type of private funding? Is it is could there be a joint venture partner that could plug a gap? You know, you don't really want to give away equity if you can, but you know, there are different options available to you in stress situations. Yeah. Another um, thing that's happening a lot in the architecture industry is we're seeing more and more architects wanting to be developers and i think this is a very positive thing it, from a lifestyle and aspiration perspective it's very good for architects because they can be the one that's calling the designs they can control the process exactly the way they want but the thing that stops lots of architects from entering into uh, development is finance what advice would you give to um like a, a, an architect uh, like a they've run their own business who are wanting to move into doing their own developments. What sorts of things do they need to have in order in order to, be able to put, position themselves to be able to get the, the best kind of finance available? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do. They, they, they give me a call, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, to answer your question, I mean, look, you have to do the research first to find out what you, what you can buy. But as I say, yeah. there, there's different ways you can go about it. You know, if, if said architect does have cash funds available, um, you know, if they can contribute towards circa 15% of the project costs, then there probably will be a structured finance option available to them. Um, mm -hmm. If they don't, but you know, they've got a good eye for identifying schemes, then maybe they can joint venture with someone else. And again, that's something that I can look to link people together to, um, depending on the areas. Um, I, I think one, someone once told me that if, the, if there is a good deal there to be done, i.e. a good project, there will be a way of, of, of arranging it. So that's interesting, actually. So if an architect can recognize potential in a site, has an idea, it, it, it could be a mixture of joint venture investment and partnership as well as institutional finance. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, let's say you've got an architect who feels they found a site where they can get planning for four houses. You know, they don't mm -hmm. really want to build the four houses because it's not their main area of business, but they know there's value here to be done. You know, if that came to me, there's different ways that I could help with that. I could probably find a developer who maybe would enter into an option agreement, which would be mm -hmm. where they would, you know, my developer would cover all the costs of getting the planning in place. Um, and if planning's granted, they've pre-agreed the price um, of which they'll sell at. You know, that way the architect has almost no risk involved. Um, they have been paid for what they've identified. Um, yep. And then they've made a profit on that basis. 
Alternatively, you know, a joint venture would be that maybe they pay for planning together. And if they get planning yeah. in place, the developer builds at cost. Okay, so you're raising funding then just purely to, to fund the at cost build rather than a build of margin. And then you look to sell it and you split the profits accordingly. Oh, that's very interesting. There's a, a number of different ways to mitigate mitigate the risk there. Absolutely. I've always been incredibly um, impressed, you know, um, with the property world in how creative it is in the way that they structure deals and financing options. And there always seems to be new financial products that are being created and that are available or people end up making a mix and match of different things in order to get things across the line. Yeah, look, there's multiple ways you can raise debt via property finance. Um, and it doesn't mm. have to be debt, as you say, you know, it can be partnership arrangements, it can be private investors. You know, you, obviously, you need to make sure you've done sufficient due diligence. You know, you want to make sure you know who you're borrowing from. Ideally, you want to be able to see a track record so you know how they perform. You know, if you were to go into a downward market, you don't particularly want lenders that are going to, you know, trigger an on-demand clause straight away. Um, yeah. So understanding how lenders are funded is, is quite important as well. Um, but there's a variety of ways that you can support projects once you understand where the value is, or can you bring other people into the scheme at a cost of maybe equity to add that missing value? Yeah. Is there a limit? Is there a limit to the amount of debt that an individual can can carry? And, and how do developers kind of get around those limits, if you like? I mean, some banks will have their own maximum exposure. Um, typically, right. it's the maximum exposure that, that the bank has to that developer. Um, yes, there are a few lenders that will have just a, a general maximum exposure across all portfolios. Um, but it, it's just a case of understanding, you know, where is the client at with those debts? You know, have they got mm -hmm. projects coming to the end of, of their term? Are they in the process of selling them? You know, it, it's more a case of, okay, what's the risk? And, and you're right. A lot of developers, you know, there, there is a name for developers overexposing themselves. And, you know, unfortunately, in some cases, it doesn't end, end well. So making sure yeah. you're not overexposed is, is really important for, from a longevity point of view. Um, but from a banking yeah, point of view, it's, it's just about risk. You know, what is the risk of this client to us defaulting? Yeah, well, obviously we hear, you know, the, the kind of carnage that happened in 2008 with lots of developers who were highly leveraged. And, you know, you hear, you hear of it today when you've got um, developers who, like, they're just they're carrying millions and millions in mortgages, essentially, in, 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 in finance. Um, how do... So... so when when a developer is in that kind of situation, then how do they protect themselves from, for example, I always remember listening to one investor, a developer talking about around about 2008, when it was a sort of house of cards scenario where one of their lenders pulled, you know, had a, you know, triggered a, a kind of callback on their loans yeah. within a sort of 28, yeah, 24 hour period or 48 hour period. And it kind of happened right across an entire portfolio, which meant there was no way that they could liquidate enough of their asset, assets in that time to be able to pay back all the, the loans immediately, which meant the business went into insolvency. And then there was a sort of 10-year period of trying to fight back for the, the portfolio. Yeah. Um, how, how, so, yeah, how, 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 do, how do developers protect themselves or how, <clears throat> yeah. you know, as a, as a, as a, architect for example working with a developer how do we assess the risk of entering into those kinds of agreements with people who yeah are, who are so highly leveraged yeah absolutely i mean and you're absolutely right you know there was loads of stories wasn't there you know post 2008 where um banks perhaps didn't act um well fairly you know i guess as anyone anyway would describe mm -hmm. wasn't it? i mean it was a very difficult market then because there was such a shortfall of liquidity um, from banks. Yep. I think that's important to note, you know, we're in a marketplace now where there is there is sufficient liquidity, you know, there is so much money available to lend um, that we're not we're not going into that type of marketplace. Um, yep. So to answer your question, it, it is tricky because most 
development lenders will expect a degree of personal guarantee. So even if it's a limited company borrower, they would expect a degree of personal guarantee. That, that can range. Um, it can range from, from a, a, a full PG or it can range to a limited based on a percentage of the project. Um, and again, you're right, there are a few lenders that would include an, an on-demand clause in their um, facility letters. So the best ways to protect themselves, one is having a good solicitor, you know, someone that can highlight these, these concerns, you know, make them aware, what would you do in this scenario? Um, a lot of lenders are quite negotiable. So, you know, if there was something which was particularly worrying to the individual, then it may be something that can be tweaked. Um, but it comes back to your previous point about exposure. You know, if you've got 20 schemes going off at once, then regardless of a bank's position, if a couple of them start to fail, you're probably already sharing resources anyway. So they're all going to start to wobble, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so I think yeah. the key thing from an architect's point of view is where it's appropriate, you know, find out how many schemes are you, are you doing at this stage, you know, and it may be that they're looking to get to land bank. You know, they might be applying for five, six different schemes with the intention of only executing on two of them this year, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but it comes down to, again, what's their resources? You know, a, a one man developer compared to a hundred man team can take different projects on. Um, again, it just comes down to assessing the individual and what they're looking to achieve and what access they have. Slightly different question here. Um, how did you get into this world? What was your pathway? Yeah, sure. So I, I was actually, I actually did a software engineering degree, um, at university. And I remember finishing off my dissertation. I went to a, to a local jobs fair thinking that I, I don't want to work in IT. It wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> for me. And advertising at the jobs fair was a, a finance company. Uh, local to me and they were what's called a packager so a packager is where um, sometimes called a master broker essentially where mm -hmm. their client base tends to be professionals so it tends to be architects solicitors accountants um, sometimes even bank referrals when that bank can't help so it's a business to business based role and I was their second employee at the time um, and we focused on the specialist types of finance. So that would be bridging loans, development finance, commercial mortgages, or potentially kind of complex terms. So that could be, you know, overseas income or, or whatever reason why it falls outside of the mainstream. Um, I was there for a very long time, really good firm. Um, we grew to over 40 strong and I became their director of, of specialist lending. Um, again, really enjoyed the time there. Fantastic company. Um, it got to a stage where I, I wanted a different challenge. Um, yeah. you know, my, I had a team of 10 people. It was going very well. And I remember saying at the time that, you know, if you're successful with a middle management role, you, you kind of work yourself out of a role, um, eventually because it comes self-performing. Um, and then as COVID happened, um, we actually had a, my wife had a second child. And so we kind of thought that, you know, it would be kind of now or never if I was going to give it a go on my own. Mm -hmm. So I launched my own company in June 2020 um, and have been going strong ever since, really. Fantastic. Brilliant. And in terms of architects or relationships that you're, that you're building with architects, how do they, how does that typically work and, and what sorts of um opportunities do you see for architects being able to to get from collaborating with people like yourself i think there's a huge opportunity because essentially there is a there's an entire business model available to architects there to mm. to support what they're already doing you know by simply referring a developer or a client over to someone like myself um to understand what's the finance options they can, they will receive a referral fee for that. And the referral fees, you know, they, they, they can be quite, quite sizable amounts depending on the scheme. Yeah. Um, you know, they want to make sure they've got the right company they're referring to. Now, that's not just a, a sales pitch for me, but they want to have someone that they can trust, that their, their fees are fair, that they're 
commission splits are fair as well and they've got the right mm-hmm. you know right contacts and approach in the marketplace um, but simply by referring clients who are already looking to develop you know in principle could double their business stream um, straight away in addition to yeah. that it's those extra parts as well you know I said before they may have someone who's got planning but doesn't want to build so again there can be a referral fee if we can find a buyer for their client and all of this is at no detriment to that client. There's no, mm. there's no cost of them to enter into these discussions. And typically there's no cost even to execute it. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's essentially it's selling more to the same clients. I love, I, I love these, these kinds of um, opportunities that are, are available. Um, and, you know, we've spoken with many of our clients here at Business of Architecture that actually being able to offer a more vertically integrated set of solutions um, to your clients is incredibly attractive. So being able to approach developers and having finance options, and particularly when, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's no shortage of kind of um, younger architecture practices working with younger develop, development companies. And so being able to um, share expertise on finance and being connectors, essentially, being connectors of, of services and of opportunities is good for everybody. Absolutely right. And that's what business is, right? Business is about working people that you like working with and you support them where you can. Um, you know, the yeah. same principle. If I have a developer in an area of a new young architect and they, they need help, we'll put them in touch mm-hmm. you know it's, it's it's about creating that kind of ecosystem where um you've got people you like working with that are good at what they do and then you, you all grow from that brilliant so if people want to get in contact with you what's the best way for them to do that yeah really flexible so they can either email me um or they can call me on either my landline number or my mobile um, really flexible however is best people approach um i can give you the details now or do you want to put them into a we can, we can put them in the, uh, in the information. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Thank you. Matt, brilliant. Absolutely fascinating. And, you know, thank you for sharing your expertise. Really interesting world of lending and finance for development. So thank you very much. No, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And, yeah, if anybody wants to have any conversations or feasibilities, then, you know, please do reach out. Absolutely. Brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.